United States paratroopers put on a demonstration of their art for recent graduates of West Point Military Academy. A slip and a pile-up, and the jump master moves fast to get the men out of the plane. This is the technique which secured the invasion of Europe, which led to Germany's final defeat. Journalists and technicians go aboard the push-button plane for a demonstration of automatic flying. The pilot sets the automatic mechanism for the entire flight. From takeoff to landing, no human hands need touch the controls. The pilot pushes the button and the plane flies itself. The plane taxis down the field and the throttles are automatically operated for an increase of takeoff speed. And the wheel comes back to lift the plane into the air. In flight, the automatic mechanism still controls the plane, throttling it down for a perfect landing. United States Army experiments have once more produced something new in aviation history. A dummy pilot is placed aboard a plane to test the United States Army's new device for getting a pilot out of a disabled plane at high speed. A special type of parachute enables the pilot to save himself after being ejected from the plane. Another test, and the dummy pilot is hurled out. The Army solves the problem of saving life in the high-speed jet planes of today and tomorrow. Tragedy in the heart of Chicago, America's second largest city. Fire breaks out in the skyscraper LaSalle Hotel in the center of the city. Death strikes in the night as flames quickly sweep the lower floors. Hundreds of people cut off on the upper floors make their way down the crowded fire escapes of the 23-story building. Hundreds were injured. As they surge down the only means of escape, the lower six floors are engulfed by smoke and flame. Many, untouched by fire, perished from smoke poisoning. Some, in panic, leapt to their death. The toll is 58 dead. So swift was the spread of the flame that only heroic work by firemen and the police kept the casualty list from mounting higher. The worst of it is over in two hours. Investigators find the lobby completely gutted by the flames, which swept like a hurricane through stairwells and elevator shafts. Next morning, knotted bed sheets hanging from upper windows tell the heartbreaking story. Here, a panic-stricken victim dropped to his death one of 14 who plunged or fell to the street. Refugees return to gather what belongings remain after one of America's worst hotel fires. At the tomb of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, founder of the Chinese Republic, an impressive ceremony marks the return of the nationalist government to the historic capital of Nanking. Among the thousands paying homage at this monument on Purple Mountain are Generalissimo and Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Recalling Japan's sack of Nanking in 1937, the Generalissimo calls upon China to consolidate her victory. The great crowd begins the descent from the 300 steps leading to the tomb. The Japanese have been driven out, but China still faces a period of difficult readjustment. Detroit, center of America's great automobile industry, marks the 50th anniversary of its beginning. Birthplace of the production line and the new idea that almost everybody could have a car. Today, still looking forward, the Motor City pauses to look back. Down the main street of the city moves the history of the American motor car. 
These rattling relics were the beginning, the birth of America's greatest industry, which since 1900 has produced 77 million automobiles. There were odd ideas of design in those early days. Perhaps the pioneers were too busy keeping the things running to think much about beauty and design. After all, they were still competing with the old-fashioned horse. They stalled and had to be cranked up again. Gradually, the horseless carriage caught on. By 1941, America had nearly 33 million cars on her highways. Ahead is a streamlined future for Detroit as the motor industry swings back from the tools that helped win the war to the needs of peace. Two years after the invasion of the Normandy coast, here American, British, and Canadian troops made the first landings that led to the defeat of Germany. At the nearby town of St. Mary Glees, Honors for the men of the famed United States 82nd Airborne Division, liberators of the first French village. The military governor of Paris awards the Croix de Guerre to the entire division. Nearby, fields of white crosses tell a story of courage and sacrifice. School children of Saint Mary Glees make a pilgrimage on the anniversary of their liberation in memory of the brave men who gave their lives in those first furious hours of the assault. Simple floral tribute to American heroes who are not forgotten, though they rest far from their homeland. The Corps of Cadets at the United States Military Academy marches in honor of the graduating class of 875, the largest class of new officers in 144 years. Among them are the sons of 21 generals and two admirals. Cadet John P. Doolittle is congratulated by his father, Air Force's Lieutenant General Jimmy Doolittle. Lieutenant General Wiedemeyer with his graduating son. One father is not here. George S. Patton IV receives his diploma from his widowed mother. At Annapolis, 812 midshipmen become full-fledged naval officers. The last wartime class was larger, but this is the Academy's biggest peacetime graduation. In flag-bedecked Galdring Hall, the colorful graduation exercises. Here, as guest of honor to award diplomas, is Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz. The commander of each company receives his men's diplomas. 35 are commissioned in the Marine Corps. All graduates will receive additional training in naval aviation. And now, an old tradition. 